Hello, everybody. This is Anthony from Retablo. And today we're speaking with someone that who's been at the beginning with Retablo, someone who pre-exists at Retablo. It's our editor, aspiring filmmaker, and dear friend, Jake Lee. How are you, Jake? How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? I'm doing great. Thank you. And today we would like to talk about your, you know, your new film that just came out, Love, Roses, and Murder. You know, let's get on it, man. Like, talk about the title and just kind of like the whole you know you know aesthetic of the whole film because there is a certain aesthetic to this whole film would you please like to explain yeah yeah so i for the aesthetic i was going for a uh more of a retro vintage type 70s love story movie you know what i mean i so kind of like I really those liked... 70 like romantic like you know like rom-coms type thing or like uh 50s like... yeah yeah exactly so i i love like the warm tones i love the look and aesthetic of uh you know celluloid film i included like theater reel markers in it i i really just went all the way out in terms of trying to aesthetically match it while also sort of telling that within the story it's Self, and you can kind of see that reflected in the title where it it feels very vintage i feel like yeah it has like a really nice like old grainy feel kind of you know a little bit like a rough around the edges but still very clear and crystal and in the film i like to talk about not only just the aesthetic but kind of like the overall production and i know that you were working with very limited resources both technical and just you know working with other people's location and just time management as well. And I just like to explore that. Like, what was it like working in that total, like in that pressure of making a film in 20 minutes? Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was pretty hectic. Um, I had to really tightly figure out the schedule because not only am I working on, on a tight schedule here and I will only get like 20 minutes to tell the story I want to tell, but I'm also working with students who are volunteering for this project. So I, I had to really work around their schedules. I had to meticulously plan out each shot that I wanted to do. Uh, granted, I left room in there in case we were on set and found something else that maybe we wanted to do. But in terms of what we got done, I had to really lay out what I wanted done and who I needed on set on a particular day. And I mean, there's, there's some actors who were only there for a limited amount of time. I mean, Sarah, who plays Mary was literally only on set for one day, despite being one of the four main cast members. We got all of her scenes done in one night. That's crazy how much you get just got to crunch in there, huh? Oh yeah, we we grinded that out. It was it was a wild and kind of hectic night, but we were able to get it. Um, we got everything pretty much first try. It was it was a lot of fun. Well, uh, what would you say like the most challenging part of it was like just time? Was it just um, I guess editing? Like, what do you think was like the hardest of the process? I I definitely think the hardest part of the process was uh, in the writing room in terms of figuring out what I could and couldn't do because the original idea that I had pitched would have been like a full 90 minute film and it would have actually cost me quite a bit of money and we weren't getting any sort of grants from the campus uh, uh you know to sort of put a budget behind it so a, a lot of it was self-funded and figuring out how I could really condense this story down to still tell a complete story in the 20 minute time slot that I was given while also making sure that everything came out right. So, I mean, we had to really rework the third, uh, the third act. We had to really rework a lot of like the character beats and the story beats. And I think we managed to get it down. Like it's a very efficient film, but not the full story. I completely wanted to tell if that makes sense. Yeah. And speaking of the characters, I, um, was watching your film and you know just making sure I have questions for this interview and I couldn't help but feel like the characters really reminiscent of Bonnie and Clyde and those kind of like old stories of two lovers <laughs> kind of like on the edge of just like life and just society and I would just like to ask if that was like direct inspiration uh partially so I mean like going into this uh it, like the original creative spark for this was based on uh, my relationship at the time, because I wrote this about, about two years ago, um, or at least the initial drafts of it. 
And it was based on my relationship at the time. Uh, it didn't work out. We ended up splitting up. And then I, uh, the story kind of evolved from there to a, a story about my experiences with a trying to date afterwards. And the whole murder part was always there. But I, for a while, it was kind of just like, oh, what's something fun we could do? And murder was like the fun thing that the couple like bonded over. And eventually it kind of did turn into a Bonnie and Clyde situation when I introduced the concept of, you know, the best friend character also being the the local detective in town who's like chasing them down, you know, Bonnie and Clyde, Dukes of Hazard style. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I can totally see like, you know, it's just kind of like like those two like ride or die type of situations. Exactly. Um, I would like to see, like, speaking of just kind of, like, the overall tone of the film, it's balancing, like, a thriller aspect, kind of, like, a murderous, ramp- like, bloody rampage, juxtapose, like, some, like, comedic moments and, like, really, I guess, charming characters, for example, the main uh, male lead. I feel like, you know, like, what was, like, kind of, like, uh... Just putting both of those together, those two styles and just like tones together. Was it something that was at the very beginning or do you feel like more at the end it was more well defined? The the horror element of it came out in the writing process because I originally thought of this idea as like just a straight rom-com. But every time I pitched it to people, they give me these looks and be concerned. They're like... Murder's murder's not funny. Why why are you joking about murder? Like, how can this be a rom com if there's murder in it? Uh, so a, a lot of it was trying to figure out how to balance that tone in there. And in terms of like the comedy writing, when we got to that stage, uh, it was it was trying to find what I thought worked comedically in it. And a lot of that really is owed to my lead actor uh, Theo, as well as. Uh, well, not Theo. His Aiden. His name is Aiden. Uh, Shout he out plays to Aiden. Theo. Shout out to Aiden. Yeah, he's he's a real champion. Him and Maddie, who plays Adeline, great job like embodying the characters. Theo, uh, Aiden just uh, he didn't even act for a majority of the movie. He was just reading the script in his voice, and his natural charm was just coming through on that. Whereas like Maddie. Her comedy comes from the character. She understood it right away. Uh, it, I described her character as like a shark in human clothes. Um, <laughs> I yeah. can very like and, I could tell she, in the film like she has kind of like this very menacing like type of aura around her, and the other guy is just like flowers and candy or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And and Maddie understood that, and so she went into it playing everything completely straight like as straight as possible but given given the circumstances the scenario and like what's going on around her i think that makes it funnier is that like she's the one like hyper serious character in a situation of like circumstantial comedy yeah i think it really works and i guess also like those two leads i would like to say visually uh i saw some sort of like color like juxtaposition between the two as one of them was wearing blue one was wearing red was this like intentional to play with color and costume it absolutely was i wanted all of the main cast to be color coded um like i wanted theo to you know be wearing blue so he's like bright and upbeat despite kind of his horrific nature which is why when we see his first kill in the movie he's actually shirtless like that that good persona has come off (laughs) bare skin yeah it, like it's it's raw he's showing like the real him in that moment um shut up i know where you're going with that <laughs> um, i'm not going like, anywhere <laughs> i'm not going anywhere good <laughs> or or like uh adeline was wearing red because she's just purely dangerous and then there's and then there's keith who's like neutral maroon when he's like in a relaxed setting uh, you know, he's kind of the neutral, fun, warm character. But when he's a cop, it's, you know, black and white. It's very good and evil. And he's, like, the always law. on the case. Yeah, I know we only see him in that for, like, one scene and then a shot later. But, you know, that was just kind of due to the limitations of the time. And then and then we have Janine, uh, Adeline's first date in the movie, wearing pink. Kind of showing that she's, like, 
a hundred percent innocent because I wanted her to be one hundred percent innocent in all of this. Um, I thought that kind of somehow got you on the side of Adeline is dangerous and kind of not to be trusted when she just kills like the sweetest person you've ever met in cold blood. She is Jaws in a cardigan, bro. Literally, literally. And then I, I initially wanted Mary, uh, Keith's girlfriend, to wear sort of like a sundress or something in like lighter tones, kind of coming off like the 50s like household wife type style and we weren't able to do that uh partially because of budget restraints and also time restraints but i think the outfit she did show up in very much kind of showed like a modern interpretation of that look uh because i wanted her to come off as kind of fake and sitcom in a way so this whole premise of you know finding the one but kind of having this like murder tendency vibe to it i feel like like it at its core it's kind of like uh it might be a reach but i feel like it's kind of sort of like a a view of modern dating is that like true is that what you know you were thinking in mind when making this film yeah it uh, very much based on my own personal experiences not a hundred percent of it is based on my personal experiences but you know yeah, you the, ain't dead the L- <laughs> you right <laughs> 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 no um so like the the parts of like trying to find that person that you that you click with and you know coming across people that are abrasive or rude or really clash with your personality your wants and desires and you know needs and learning to come to peace with that and kind of also kind of dealing with the ups and downs of that i mean we see theo kind of struggle with the you know excuse me, the feelings of like isolation and loneliness and whatnot. You know, he, when he's talking to Keith and he's like, I'm 43. Uh, I still haven't found the one at this point. There is no one. And Keith, like in that scene, in that scene, both characters were kind of representative of my own two schools of thought. Like we, like, I was like, Oh, there's no one out there for me. I'm, I'm going to be alone forever. And then, Keith was my voice of reason where he's like, no, 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 just keep going at it, dude. Like you, you just got to keep trying. Sea. There's plenty of fish in the sea. There's someone out there for you. Like you just got to keep going. And then sometimes you do need that push to really find that person. And so he's like, Hey, let's do a double date. You got to find someone by Valentine's day, which like, I realized we have no reference for how soon or far away that is from when that scene takes place. It's like tomorrow. But, but the, he's like, it's Valentine's Day. It's like, how am I supposed to find someone by then? And we get the implication that that's very soon. And so, like, Theo's, like, in a rush to find that person. When creating this film, did you have someone in mind that you wanted to take inspiration from, like, directly when it was when it came to, like, a comedy element or a horror element or a storytelling element? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I cite a few different influences on uh who sort of went into this project uh, it, to to name like a couple of them there's uh, edgar wright in terms of like camera work and uh, trying to get that quick editing of course i didn't fully try to recreate his style it, but i more drew inspiration from his style of comedy and writing uh we got like james gunn who does like a lot of interesting camera movements uh i really love his work especially in his newest stuff uh, and so that really fed into how I treated the camera in this. I, I treated the camera almost as its own character. Uh, and then, of course, one of my favorite directors of all time, Sam Raimi. I mean, I love the Evil Dead trilogy. Uh, I I love how he directs things. Even in his weaker movies, I still love how they turn out. So I I really liked that. And Sam Raimi was more of what I was looking for in terms of the inspiration. And you can see that in uh, a couple of the kills or like the fight scene between Theo and Adeline in terms of like how that's directed and the kind of images that I chose to portray in that moment. Well, that's all the questions that I have for now. And I understand that you have some for me for a particular <laughs> portion of the, of the film. Yeah. So just uh, give me a second to take over Retablo. Uh, so Hi, my name's Jake, and I am now running Retablo for the next few minutes. Oh, that's how we're doing this? Okay. <laughs> that's okay. how we're doing this. Okay, I'm looking cool. dead at the camera, and I'm addressing the audience. Yeah, it's, okay, it's cool. my turn now. 
<laughs> so, Anthony, uh, you created two entire songs for Love, Roses, and Murder. Uh, Tom Verlaine... And Don't Let Me Die Alone Tonight. Yes, I Both did. Both fan- fantastic songs. You, you and everyone involved in those uh, did amazing work. I love how they turned out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, what was the inspiration for Tom Verlaine? We'll start with that one. Um, well, Tom Verlaine, if uh, those in the audience that are not familiar with that name... Tom Verlaine was the lead guitarist for uh n- like 1970s like post punk art rock band television, and um I was actually listening to a lot of television like these past couple of months. I just am in love with that record, Marky Moon, and just his guitar playing and the way that he approaches chords and soloing, and just kind of building that like kind of like 70s rock sound. Um, and I, yeah. I, and for a while I was just playing by myself and just like, oh, just like, you know, I really like the way that he put this chord. I uh, like the way that he plays his rhythm guitar. These are really interesting little licks and everything. And I'm like really like into it. Tom Verlaine as a song idea did not come into fruition at all until you were talking about making a score for your, the Love Roses and Murder film. And, you know, you know me as being a musician, as a guitar player. Y- you, yeah. Uh, I think you reached out first, or I asked. I I, I forgot which one was first. Uh, you were actually the first person I I reached out to about doing the soundtrack for this movie. But eventually, uh, I met with Magnolia, uh, who's also fantastic with music, and yeah, she's amazing. She took over majority of the music, but I still wanted to include you in there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Magnolia is also a great, you know composer and i feel like you know her scoring of the film when it came to composing um pieces just to you know paint the background of the film i think she did a wonderful job but um when it came to my side mine was more like rough and you know like (laughs) rocky versus very meticulously assembled i mean i would say ours was you know not as meticulously assembled but it, it was assembled in a way where it was just different. Um, ours was. Like, I mean, it sounds professional to me. So I mean, oh, like, um, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like when uh, you approached me about the idea of writing music for the film, I I jumped on board immediately. Um, I knew that you know since we're really close friends and we love making art and just helping each other out, it was just kind of like almost a given. Um, yeah. And I asked for like the type of vibe you were going for. And at first, I think during the writing process of the film, you were talking about maybe like a bar scene or something like kind of gruff or whatever. And I'm like, oh, maybe like a rock tune. And at first I was trying to do like maybe like a blues jam, like 12 bar blues. But then it didn't feel as like gritty pumping or whatever. And I think later on you decided not to go with that type of situation. It was completely different from what ended up on the final product. Um, and so what I thought was like, you know what, I'll, you know, I'll do a kind of like an O to television and Tom Verlaine, especially because earlier this year uh, we lost Tom Verlaine, you know, he passed away, RIP Tom Verlaine. Oh. And I felt like this was kind of like, rest a, in peace. Yeah. RIP bro. Um, um, I feel like I wanted to make some sort of tribute to, you know, keep in memory of his just um, not only Tom Verlaine, but also Richard Lloyd, also like the second guitarist of television. I don't want to not credit him as well. Um, Also, Fred Smith and Billy Ficka, you guys are amazing as a band. Um, But I kind of wanted to pay tribute to just what inspired me and what I found so inspiring to be about him and the guitar and so that's when I kind of like, you know, play with the ideas. And if I'm being honest, I feel like I kind of took direct, very direct inspiration from the song See No Evil, the first track. And it's probably my favorite track just because of how perfect of like a rocket banger it was. Um, I just love like the little flourishes and the chords that have like really cool color tones. Yeah. And I, I decided just, you know what, I, I'll make a rhythm guitar track inspired, like, inspired by, 
you know, that sound and style. So once I had the idea of making a television inspired sound or like song, I brought it to my bandmates who at the time we were all in this band class together. Shout out to Dr. Jay Bennett who produced and um, recorded the songs. Um, it wouldn't be, you know, possible without him. And he's kind of like really pivotal you know, like th- none of this would happen without him. I'm not, th- I don't have the best equipment, but he was kind enough uh, to kind of let this song go into fruition <clears throat> and find the time to help record and mix and master it. But I would also like to shout out the people who performed and I don't know, like kind of completed this I- fractured idea. Um, Manny on bass and Haley on drums both of them are amazing musicians and dear friends of mine and i really do appreciate them like wanting to play the music that i composed and we put things together you know that whole bass interlude was manny's idea combining with that like you know arpeggiated guitar part and Haley on drums just really brought in the energy playing live and yeah the energy in that song is phenomenal yeah, it, it was just kind of like one of those moments where like it felt so, even though we might not be perfectly in time, it just felt so much fun to play. And that's kind of like one of our favorite songs to play because like it just like, wow, we made this together. We had a lot of fun making it. We have a lot of fun like playing it. Um, and so, you know, thank you to Josh, Haley and Manny. You know, it wouldn't be, you know, a thing without it. I mean, on the film when we were seeing it together, the you know, in the driving scene, and we hear like, just like the drums and like the guitar and bass going crazy, and we're like, "Oh, that's us!" <laughs> yeah, really honored to be included into this like you know art, and it's it's really a privilege. So like, thank you oh, for letting us. Every be everyone who saw uh, everyone who saw the early cuts of the film and saw that scene just fell in love with the music. It was great. Uh, I want to say though, personally, the song that I fell in love with was Don't Let Me Die Alone Tonight. It was an absolutely beautiful guitar, like two minute guitar solo, like on your own. Uh, and that played over the end credits of the film. And, uh, maybe you could tell me a little bit about like what the inspiration for that was or like kind of where, where that came from, because that <laughs> felt like it had soul to it. You know Thank what I mean? Thank you. Um, great transition. <laughs> um, so I would first like go off with the title. It's something that you came up with, and I think it was your cousin or one of your friends from back at home. I was my sister. It was your sister, okay. And um, yeah, you came up with the name, and honestly, like when I made it, I mean, I had I had the the whole song in mind. It was just until to like record it, and that was basically it. Like honestly, it's not a very hard song to learn or play. For me, it was just kind of second nature, and it was just a matter of just maybe like, you know, um, putting it together. I like one of the sections is just an arpeggiated, you know, cowboy chord, and the other part was just kind of this other thing that I was working on, like learning sus chords. And no, that's not a joke. That is legit what it's called. Oh, I know. Um, <laughs> um so like the whole chord progression and just the sound of the song, like, was direct inspiration from the Mount Erie song off of Lost Wisdom, You Swan Go On. Big shout out to Phil Elvrum. He's a legend. One of my favorite artists of all time. You interviewed him on this channel, right? Yeah. I mean, I know the answer to this. No, you I know the, the video, you were the, you were the editor. So like, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Just, you know, not, not to be pedantic or whatever, but like, yeah. And you know, he, uh, it's just something that like playing with the nylon guitar and it might not be like the most professional, like, classical gray just kind of this like rinky dinky like kid toy version of a nylon string guitar and i was like like that sound and how intimate and quaint it really feels and yeah we were just asking them like maybe something simple and for an end credit sequence i like you know what i don't think that would be that bad and when we put it together and you were like you were like when i sent it to you, you were very like pleased with it and you were like you know glowing about him how like it just I, fits so I well. think that's an understatement. I fell in love with it the moment you sent it to me and I heard it. Like, I'm like, that's it. That's it right there. You, you found like the I sound of this movie. 
Yeah, no, you understood the assignment and you obliterated it. Like this, that it was phenomenal. It I sound like a bomb. I absolutely what the adore hell it. Obliterated. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just like too good. Just had to destroy it. Oh God, you're just too good, man. Too good. Whew. Well, that's all I have time for. Now I'm passing the channel right back on to Anthony. He will go ahead and run Retablo from here. However, I am also editing, so I can do whatever I want with it. Kind of. Anyway, here's Anthony. <laughs> Thank you, Jake, for handing back my channel. <laughs> well, everybody, that's all the questions I have for Jake Lee, and that's all the questions we he asked for me. And I would like the only thing I like to end this um, interview off was go watch Love Roses and Murder on the Jake Lee YouTube channel. Plus, bloopers is pretty funny because someone got to say who just let him cook. Let him cook. That's how we're ending this. Let him cook. Let him cook. Hold up. Let him cook. Crazy. And, you know. <coughs> <coughs> oh my god. <coughs> so. <coughs> oh, you got it. <coughs> <coughs> so, keep going. About what you're Oh. <coughs> well, everybody that. <coughs> oh my god! <coughs> Dog, what? <coughs>